Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, let me remind you guys that we record every single session. And so if you end up missing a week or you can't make it or you need to dig back in and kind of go deeper or rehash, recover something that we talk about, all of these videos are posted on YouTube. I send you the link to each week's video um, in our recap email. So you've always got the opportunity to go back, watch at your own pace or catch up on anything that you missed. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember that we started talking about what we call the intermediate state. That is the, um, the, the reality and existence of the current heaven and hell, the current afterlife, and what it is like and how it contrasts with the eternal heaven and the eternal hell that God promises is coming one day. And um, we got through about half of the material that I thought we were going to get to. You guys had so many questions, which was wonderful. There was a lot of great conversation. And so I last week I said, look, without trying to squish all this information into one session, let's cut it in half. And so this is the second week in which we're going to cover the intermediate state. Now, I'll tell you guys, we're going to do a quick refresher. And I promise you, we are going to blitz over what we talked about last week with a brief pause to discuss more about the Bema judgment seat that we've talked about. And if you missed last week, I'll give you a short refresher on that. And also um, to answer a couple of questions that you guys had regarding the idea of rewards in heaven, heaven not being the same for everybody, um, that sort of thing. And then we're going to get into the question. Sorry, I'm just putting my watch on mute so she doesn't bother us. Um, we're going to get into the questions that you guys submitted. Lots and lots of good stuff. So let's let's dive right in. Okay, let's not waste any time tonight. Um, I'm going to put this kind of timeline that we began working with last week here on the screen so that we can kind of walk through this process of what we talked about. Okay, again, this is going to be super fast. If you're like, I'm lost, I didn't catch last week, go back and watch the recap video. Okay, so we talked about the fact that Hebrews chapter number nine, verse 27 tells us that each person is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So death is kind of our doorway. It's the entryway into the afterlife. And once we die, we face what we call the particular judgment, okay? The particular judgment. That's not a word that's found in the Bible. That's kind of a phrase that theologians and scholars use. And basically, this judgment it decides whether or not you are a believer in Christ, whether or not you have placed your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and your reunion or reconciliation with God the Father. That's the only thing that's judged. When you die, you're not going to stand before God and there's a long movie of your life playing. There's not going to be cosmic scales in which your good is put on this side and your bad is put on that side. In the particular judgment, literally, the scripture says they're going to open what's called the Lamb's Book of Life. They're going to look and say, okay, is there ever a point in which Dan Swayze placed his faith and trust in Jesus as his personal savior? And then did his life bear evidence or fruit of that? If yes, then you are going to go into what we might call the temporary heaven. And then uh, if no, you're going to go into what we might term the temporary hell. Now, for those of you guys that are like, whoa, wait a sec, temporary heaven, temporary hell. Let me just remind you of Revelation chapter number 21. Okay. In Revelation 21, we pointed this out last week. John is getting a vision of eternity. And he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So there is a current heaven, a current earth that exists. And one day God is going to reconstruct, recreate, refashion earth and heaven without sin, the way it was always meant to be. And that new heaven and that new earth actually becomes the eternal destination that we are all going to experience. So we go through this particular judgment, okay? And um, there is a time, and we have no idea how long this time is. So far, it's been thousands of years. The time for the end of the temporary afterlife and the beginning of the physical resurrection that we read about in uh, Revelation chapter number 20. Uh, we don't know when that's going to happen, but at some point, God says there is going to be a physical resurrection of the dead. This is going to coincide with the return of Jesus, the second coming of Christ. And you can read all about this in um, Revelation chapter number 20. Essentially, what you'll read is that there are two or the res the physical resurrection takes place in two phases. 
First, we read about Christians being resurrected prior to the thousand year reign of Christ, the millennium. And then after that, we read about the physical resurrection of those who uh, are not believers, those who have rejected God and will continue to reject God into eternity, as we'll discover next week. Okay. So, Revelation 20, that tells you about both the physical resurrection to life of the just, the faithful, and the physical resurrection of the unjust, or we might call them the damned, okay? So you can read more about that there. Now, we talked last week about the fact that when this resurrection happens, the final judgment that's going to occur for non-believers, that is people who have rejected God, they've never received forgiveness of their sin, is called the great white throne judgment. And that's taken from Revelation chapter number 20, in which John says, uh, I saw a great white throne. Okay, here, let me put it on the screen for you just so you can catch it. Uh, I saw a great white throne and one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. The books were open, the book of life, and the dead were judged according, what they had, according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So scripture says the sea gave up its dead, death and grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Now, please remember what we talked about last week. This is the judgment of people who have rejected God. Essentially, people who have said, God, I don't need forgiveness of my sins. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a good person. I don't need you, don't want you, anything like that. So one day they're going to stand before God. God's going to open the Lamb's book of life, and he's going to say, look, there's never a time in which you place your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You've been saying this whole time that you are a good person. Are you really? Let's find out. And we read here in this passage that all of these people are judged according to their deeds, right? And so um, it says here, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So this is the point at which you're going to kind of relive life. This is the point at which your highs and lows, your good and bad, everything's going to be weighed out. And God tells us up front that nobody is going to pass this judgment, okay? Nobody's good good is going to outweigh their bad because the standard that God uses is perfection. It's not like one more good deed than one more bad deed. That's not how it works. Literally, if there is one sin on this side of the scale, then you need to receive forgiveness and new life. You need to be born again. But since these people chose not to, God is going to show them just how short they fell of his perfect standard. So this is called the great white throne judgment. Again, only non-believers will be a part of it, and you can read about that here in Revelation chapter number 20, okay? Now, we talked last week about the fact that while uh, people, unbelievers, non-believers, will be facing the great white throne judgment, Christians do not go through this judgment. Instead, we face what is called the Bema judgment seat. And we talked about the fact that this word Bema, okay, so in, in uh, first, second Corinthians, sorry, Paul says, we must Christians must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that phrase, judgment seat of Christ, it literally says the Bema seat of Christ. We talked last week about how Bema was an Olympic or a race judge. So not a legal judge. This is not a courtroom. We're not trying guilt or innocence or anything like that. Instead, what we're saying is, uh, have you won your race? Have you run your race well? And will you receive a reward? In the same way that in modern Olympics, if you win the race, you receive a gold medal. In the ancient Olympics, if you receive a race, you uh, if you win the race, sorry, you receive a crown. That's what that was their reward. The scripture says that we will receive rewards for running our race race well, for following Jesus well. Now. Um, you guys had a lot of questions about the Bema judgment seat, particularly questions like, um, you know, what are the rewards we can get? How do I earn them? If I'm trying to earn them, is that wrong? Like, are my motives wrong? Will I lose the reward because I'm hoping to get the reward? And then like, if I lose a potential reward, how can it be heaven if there's a loss and all of those different things? So I want to pause for just a quick moment, okay, and give you a little more information on this concept of the Bema judgment and rewards that believers will receive one day in heaven. This is going to be important in a couple 
couple of weeks when we start talking about what heaven is really like and what we're going to experience and do all of eternity, the, the things that happen at the Bema judgment seat will actually impact the eternity that we experience. So I um, gave you a few of the very um, important scriptures last week regarding this. Okay, so in um, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, Okay, we read here in verses 11 through 15, Paul says this, he says, for no one can lay any other foundation uh, besides the one that's already been laid, which is Christ Jesus. He says this, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If it has been built, uh, if what has been built survives, then the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even as though one barely escaping through the flames, okay? Okay. So Paul says essentially like imagine a building that's being built and you can build with concrete, you can build with like precious metals, and if fire were to come to that building, it would remain, right? The fire cannot burn stone and gold and precious jewels and all those different things. But if the building is built from wood or hay or, you know, something like that, it'll go up in a moment. And he says our lives are essentially like that. We, in following Jesus, we do good deeds. We kind of build a life of following Christ. And sometimes our motives are pure and sometimes they're impure. And on Judgment Day, at the Bema seat, essentially, we're, our works are going to be revealed for what they are. Did I do them so that I would be noticed? Did I do them because they made me feel superior? I'm better than everybody else. Or did I do them because I love Jesus and I love people? This fire, this judgment is going to reveal whether or not our works were motivated by the right things and whether or not they deserve reward or recognition from God throughout all of eternity. Now, this is one passage. There are many, many more. I want to give you one that I didn't share with you last week. This is called the parable of the 10 minus. This is in uh, Luke chapter number 19. Yeah, Luke 19. Okay, the parable of the 10 minus. And you're going to notice if you're familiar with the scripture, this passage, this parable, it bears a striking resemblance to the parable of the 10 talents that Jesus tells in the gospel of Matthew. But there are some key differences. And these key differences actually support the idea that there will be differing levels of reward, recognition, and honor in heaven based on what we do for Christ and for the kingdom here on earth. So let's read it really quick here. It's a bit of a long parable, but we're going to go through it pretty quick, okay? Um, while they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said this, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So the noble man here in the story is Jesus. Jesus, he goes to a distant country, so to speak, okay? And he uh, is going to be crowned king and he's going to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas or 10 pieces of money. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. So Jesus is kind of referencing like the world who would crucify the king. OK, uh, he was made king, however, and he returned home. This is the second coming in this parable story. So the king goes away and he returns back crowned in glory. Then he sent for his servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one said, uh, sir, your mina has, uh, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Watch this now. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Now watch what happens. The second one came and said, sir, your mina has earned five more. And his master said, you take charge of five cities. So this is different. The first guy, because of what he did with what he was given, he was put in charge of 10 cities. The second guy is only put in charge of five cities. So this is uh, speaking to that judgment that happens at the return of Christ, the resurrection. And Jesus says, some people are going to receive bigger rewards than others. And then we end kind of here on this sad note, 
The other servant came and said, sir, here's your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. Essentially, he was like, dude, I was terrified that I was going to lose the money when I invested it. And if I came, if you came back and I had nothing, you would have been furious. Well, that was a miscalculation. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I was a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, that's not fair. He already has 10. But the master replied, uh, I tell you that to anyone who has more, more will be given. But for as for those who, uh, but as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. So we see in this story here, okay, Jesus clearly sets this up as happening at judgment day. And this is clearly the king subjects. So we're talking about Christians here. And there are differing rewards that are commensurate with the faithfulness. This does not indicate that these people don't go to heaven or they're not a part of the kingdom, okay? In the parable of the 10 minas, the one who didn't do anything with the money he was given, he's not kicked out of the kingdom. He doesn't cast him out into outer darkness. He simply says, I'm incredibly disappointed, and the one mina you have is going to be taken away and given to somebody else. Now, um, you guys... Uh, you were like, man, Dan, okay, like, I see what you're saying here in scripture, that there could be differing levels of reward. And, and I, I get, I guess I get that. But how can it be that I get to heaven? And God says, no, Dan, you, um, you were a pastor, but you did it because you like to be on stage. And you loved people looking to you for answers. And the reality is you didn't care about them. You didn't care about me. You did this for you. Now you're still saved. You're still a Christian because you put your faith in Jesus, but the fire of the beam of judgment has revealed the works you built were wood, hay, and stubble. They don't stand. Therefore, you miss out on the reward. And when you think of it in those terms, it's really hard to say, well, how could it be heaven if I'm there and I suffer loss and I'm disappointed? That sounds terrible. It doesn't sound like the heaven I know of, and it doesn't sound like a heaven I want to go to. So um, this has been a question that Christians have struggled with for a long time. And there's a very famous um, preacher in history past, okay, in the, I think he's in the 1600s, named Jonathan Edwards, okay, he's a Puritan preacher, his famous sermon was sinners in the hands of an angry God, all right, that's what he's well known for, um, and so he preached a different sermon one time, and he addressed this thing, and he says, okay, look, for a lot of you Christians, he said, let's use the, um, sorry, let me find my screen here. Um, he says, you think of, uh, you think of yourselves like vessels or jars. Okay. And you get filled up with uh, blessings from God in, in eternity, rewards, you know, your salvation counts for some. And then if you do good things, then God rewards you. And so he basically says, look, on, on judgment day, there are going to be these super saints, okay? And they are like full jars of water. You've got salvation plus all the good deeds you did. You're full to the brim and you are just like, yes, everything I ever wanted, I'm getting, I'm getting rewarded. And then there are people like me, you know, and I'm represented by this second jar down here at the bottom where it's like, yeah, I've got my salvation, but God's going to show me all the rewards that I could have had, all the things that I missed out on. And you think to yourself, Eternity is going to be empty on some level because I know that I am missing out on some good reward that I should have received, okay? That's the way many of you are thinking about this based on the questions that you submitted and things. This is the way I thought about it for a very, very long time. But 400 years ago, Jonathan Edwards came up with a better analogy or metaphor that I think will, will help you to understand what's actually going on here. So rather than looking at this like we are all jars and based on how many rewards we get, we will get filled up with joy and honor and recognition in heaven. And some people are going to be overflowing at the brim and some are just going to have a barely drop of water in the bottom. Instead, the way that we should think about this is as if there was a great ocean and there were jars of different sizes. 
okay? And those different sizes are representative of the amount of honor or joy that you could possibly receive. And all the jars are cast into the sea. They're all filled and floating in this great ocean of joy and love and celebration. Now, there are some jars that are bigger than others, and there are some that are smaller than others. But here's the key. Every jar is full. Every jar has received as much joy, honor, reward as it possibly can. So it's not a sense in which you're like, I'm empty. You are full. You are experiencing the best experience, the best existence that you ever have in your entire life. There is nothing, never a moment on earth that will ever compare to what you experience in heaven. And we're not going to look at, you know, other jars, so to speak, other Christians. And we're like, oh, they got so many more rewards than me. That's not fair. We're not going to, envy is not even a thing in God's kingdom anymore. Okay. So I think this sort of visual might help us to understand a little bit better what it is going to be like to receive rewards and yet for it still to be heaven, for it still to be wonderful, for it still to be a blessing. Okay, now that's a lot. And over the next few weeks, when we talk about heaven and what it's like, we're going to talk about what these rewards could be, how they might impact what you experience and what you do. So there is more discussion on this coming, I promise. But I want to open it up for a moment and see if you guys still have other questions kind of regarding the Bema seat, the idea of rewards and all of that. Um, I'm getting a direct message here. Do, 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 do. Maybe we can use heaven and new heaven instead of temporary heaven and eternal heaven. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Thanks. So, um, you know, we're talking about heaven, new heaven, temporary heaven, uh, eternal heaven. I'll try to adjust my language as much as I can. Thanks for that message. Okay. Um, any questions? Go ahead, unmute. Let's have a little bit of conversation here regarding uh, the Bema seat, rewards in heaven. What are you thinking? What are you still confused about? good so far <laughs> okay well we don't have to belabor it and again we're going to circle back to this but i want you guys to make sure that you have opportunity to kind of ask questions and dig in a little bit if you want to cool all right so here's what we're going to do from this point on tonight it's going to be lots of conversation Okay, this is like, I'm going to be the teacher asking questions, and I'm not calling anybody by name. So I want you guys to just jump in and popcorn in and give me answers. Okay, so what we want to do at this point is ask the question, what can we know about the current uh, heaven and the current hell? OK, um, we talk about this as the intermediate state. All right. What is it that we can know about it? If my grandfather died and he went to heaven or my grandmother died and she's not in heaven what is it like what are they experiencing what can we learn from the scripture okay in order to do that we're going to look at three passages and i'm going to involve you guys to read these three passages okay so you'll see them here on the screen and i'm going to ask you if you've got a bible handy pull it out and look up some of the look up one of these passages or if your phone is nearby you have a secondary device you can totally google this there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever we're going to look at luke chapter number 16 verses 19 to 31 this is the parable of the rich man and lazarus we're going to look at revelation chapter number six verses 9 through 11, and this is a picture of the elders in heaven, and then we're going to look at Revelation chapter number 4, verses 2 through 4, which is a picture of the martyrs in heaven, okay? So um, go ahead, and I may have had those Revelation passages, but we'll I might have them switch, but we'll get to it in just a moment, okay? So go ahead and look it up. I don't care what translation you read from. I'm going to put the new international version on the screen so you can read along with us, but um, what we're going to do is in each of these three passages, we are going to see people who are in the current or the, uh, the temporary heaven and hell that exists today, okay? All of these things take place before the events of Revelation 20, 21, and 22. So they apply to the current 
heaven and hell, the current afterlife. And as we read these, we're going to go through and we're going to ask questions about the characteristics and qualities that we see, the clues that are there inside of each one of these passages. So who's got Revelation chapter number 16, verses 19 through 31, and you're willing to read quickly and clearly for everybody in the group, please. I can read it. Love it. Let's do it. I have NLT if that's okay. Totally fine. Okay. Jesus said there was a certain man, certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in, there in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the, tongue, dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue. I am anguished in these flames. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that you're, during your lifetime, you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. Now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here and no one can cross over to us from there. The, then the rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send, send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, no, Father Abraham. But if someone sent them to, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Thank you, Kara. All right. Now, if you have never heard that story, you don't know who Abraham is, guess what? Over the next like four weeks, we are going to spend so much time in this passage that you are going to feel comfortable standing up and preaching this text to somebody else. You're going to know it better than you know John 3.16 by the time we get done over the next few weeks. So don't let your unfamiliarity with it today um, you know, make you feel bad because you're going to know it really well. All right. Who's got Revelation chapter number six, verses nine through 11 for us? I have it. Thank you. Um, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Okay, so this is actually the text that gives us a picture of the martyrs in heaven, people who have died because of their testimony in Jesus. Okay, we're going to circle back to that in just a moment. Who has uh, the last passage, Revelation chapter number four, verses two to four, a uh, picture of the elders in heaven? You can read it right off the screen if you want to. It doesn't hurt my feelings any at all. I can read again. Go for it. Thank you. At once, I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of a jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crown, crowns of gold on their heads. Perfect. Thank you, Sherry. Okay. So what we're going to do from this point on is I am going to give you a statement of fact 
based on these passages. And what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to call out from any of those three passages the evidence you see that my statement is true. Okay. If that sounds a little weird, I promise you're going to pick it up super, super fast. Here we go. Um, statement number one, we are conscious in the afterlife. When we die and we go to the current heaven or hell, we are awake, aware, and conscious. What evidence in those three passages do you see that that is true? In my... um, I would say um, Abraham being able to like have senses. Mm -hmm. Okay. That might be uh, like a notion to show that we're conscious. Okay. Yeah. So we see that right in Abraham, who is having a conversation. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of talk about like um, anguish or torment, dipping in water, wanting a drink. You know, there's conversation. I think I mentioned that. So yeah, in, in uh, Luke chapter number 16, we see at least three characters in the afterlife. They are fully conscious fully aware, and they're interacting with one another. Great point. Okay, what else? How about in the passage with the martyrs? Let me put that here on the screen. What do you see here that indicates they are conscious? The martyrs uh, seem to appear to have memories. Okay, there we go. That's an interesting point that we're going to circle back to in just a moment. But yes, they seem to have some mind. They seem to have some conscious. They have a memory of their past life. Yes, absolutely. What else? Verse 10, that they called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and yeah. true, holy judge. So in death, they are interacting with God. There is a, a, a question and they receive a response, actually. And so, um, yeah, we see that these people who have died and are in heaven, they're around the throne and they're not unconscious. They're not asleep. They are fully awake. They are engaged. They are conversing or praying even to God. Okay. Anything else? How about in this uh, Revelation 4 passage? Um, we've got these uh, 24 elders. Anything that indicates that they're conscious there? I'm cool with silence. It doesn't bother me at all, you guys. I, I was a youth pastor for a decade and a half, man. I'm used to asking questions and getting blank stares. Give me, give me a guess here. Jump in, unmute. Let's do it, Arlen. It looks okay. like they can observe uh, things going on around them. Okay. Yeah, so we might infer from some of the things and some of the context here that they are able to observe things that are happening. Anything else? They respond to actually what's going on around them, too. They interact, whether it be laying down their crowns, they're in worship, yeah. so they, they are interacting with what's going on. They're responding oh. to it, right? Yep, so if we jump down here a little bit later in the context, uh, they lay their crowns down before the throne. They say, you're worthy, or our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. The fact that they're sitting on thrones, they're not like lying in graves or floating there as ghosts or anything like that. We are conscious in the afterlife. Here's the truth. Every single person, that we have a picture of in the afterlife, whether they are in the current heaven or hell, or they are, Hello. Uh, they are all. Nandos email mo, dun naman sinesend eh. Somebody's chatting here. Can we make sure we're muted if we're having an off-camera conversation? Thanks so much. Um, so everybody is conscious, okay? Everybody is conscious. And that is um, a, a good sign that everybody is conscious in the afterlife. Okay, here's another statement of fact. I want you to think through those three passages and give me the um, evidence that this statement is true. 
we carry our same identities into the afterlife. So this is pretty easy if we go to Revelation, uh, pfft, Revelation, Luke chapter number 16. What evidence do we see here from this passage that identity is carried on into the afterlife? Um, just Abraham asking uh, for his brothers to be warmed. Okay. So it wasn't Abraham. It was the rich man. But yes. Oh, the rich right. man. Sorry. No, no, totally. It's a great point. He remembers his family connections. He knows he has brothers back home. In fact, not only does he know that he has brothers back home, he knows that his brothers are like wild and out and not living for the Lord. And so he says, can you please send Lazarus back to warn them not to make the same mistake I did? Yes, he has the same family identity in eternity. Great one. What else? How about the fact that they look up and they're like, oh, Father Abraham, they know this guy from the Old Testament. Abraham hasn't been around since the book of Genesis, like 3,000 some odd years ago, but they know who he is, and he is the same guy, the same Abraham from Genesis 12, 14, 18. Oh, man, I'm a bad pastor. I don't remember the exact, you know, it's a long section in the middle of the book of Genesis. And it's the same guy. He carries the same identity. He is Father Abraham to them, the father of their religion. All right, let's move on. I mean, we can keep going, right? Lazarus, we find here, you know, you received your good things in life and he received bad things. There is this continuity of identity in eternity. But um, look here at the, uh, at the martyrs around the throne. What evidence do we have that they have the same identities in heaven? Come on, jump in, guys. We're going to run out of time fast tonight. Um, they were still looking to be avenged. That's right. They were looking for justice. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So they remembered that they were beheaded for their testimony in Jesus. They had that continuity of identity. They didn't merge into some kind of consciousness. They were the martyrs. Not everybody in heaven is a martyr. Not everybody in heaven is crying out for justice, but these people are uniquely because of what they experienced in life, all right? Now, this one, look, this one's a little deeper. Some of you guys might be able to pick up on this. Some of you might not because you, you may not know exactly based only on this one verse, but let's give it a try. Revelation chapter number four, we see 24 thrones and 24 elders. 24 is an interesting number because it's 12 times two, okay? So what clues here might we have about who these elders are and why there is continuity or why there is an identity carried into the afterlife? Is it something? Sorry. Please go ahead. Would it have something to do with like the 12 tribes of uh, Israel? Nailed it. That's half the 12. Who's the other 12? Disciples. That's, that's it. Okay. So the 24 elders are 12, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel from the book of Genesis and the 12 apostles from the gospels. And the 12 tribes of Israel, they represent all of the Old Testament saints and the 12 apostles represent all of the New Testament saints. They are all together, same group in the same thrones around the, thro uh, around the throne of God. So there is this continuity between who they were and who they are today. Wonderful. That is great, great insight, you guys. Okay, let's keep going. Um, we have some level of awareness about what is happening on earth. You guys have kind of already given me some evidence here, but we can quickly mention those. And there are a couple others that we might uh, point out here. In the afterlife, we apparently have the capacity to maintain some awareness about what is happening here on earth. What evidence do you see in uh, Luke chapter number 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus? I think Anthony maybe mentioned this a moment ago. Uh, yeah, the rich man wanted to, if uh, 
his uh, brothers will also know about uh, hell so that they could be warned. That's exactly right. Yep. So he still knew that he had brothers. He remembered their lifestyle and he was concerned about them. He still knew that they were there and needed to be warned. Wonderful. Okay. How about the martyrs around the throne? Uh, what evidence do we see here that they have an awareness of what is happening on earth? Well, if they're saying how long before you judge the people, yeah. then they're saying, when are you going to do it? That's it. Absolutely. They are aware of the fact that justice still not has not been dealt in their situation. The people who murdered them for their faith have not met their judgment yet. Okay. All right. Um, we don't we don't have to go into the next passage. You see here, there is at least the potential for some awareness on earth. Now, we want to be careful here. This doesn't mean that everybody up in heaven is just looking down on earth. Your Aunt Susie passes away, and she gets to watch the rest of your life. I, we don't know that that's what happens, and yet we are told explicitly in several places that people in the current afterlife have some awareness of the things that are happening here on earth. All right, let me give you another one. The current heaven and hell are physical, not merely spiritual. They are physical, not merely spiritual, okay? This is important. I keep telling you guys, physical is not bad. Man was created as a living soul when he had spirit and body, flesh together, okay? Uh, based on the story of the rich man and Lazarus, what do we see here that eternity is physical or the current heaven or hell is physical in some way, shape, or form? Maybe that he was like thirsty and yes. wanted to drink. Yeah, that is a biological urge. And it could be symbolic. I can totally admit that. But it seems really specific, right? Like have him dip his finger in water and come quench my tongue. Finger, tongue. I mean, those are specific bodily, physical things. Okay, what else? There's another thing here in this passage. How about that phrase right there? Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom is the way the King James put it. He's like, he's getting a hug from Abraham. That's literally what this says. He's getting, Abraham's arm is around him. Again, this could be symbolic, but it seems like Jesus is saying this intentionally. And maybe we should understand that the current heaven and even the current hell are more physical than we might realize. Uh, let's let's move on here. We look at um, the, the story of the martyrs here. Um, what evidence do we see in verse number 11 that they are physical in some way, shape, or form? They were given robes. Yes, exactly right. They're given robes. Ghosts don't wear robes. Only something with a body can have a robe. Again, could this be a physical description of something? Yeah, I mean, a, a symbolic description of something. Yes, it could be. But it's really weird that we keep seeing physical language, physical language, physical language. All right. What about the last passage, the elders? Uh, what do we see here that says they might be, uh, this might be a physical realm? They're sitting. They're sitting on thrones. Right. And if we scroll down here, the 24 elders fall down before him. They lay their crowns. They say, right? How do you say something without vocal cords? I don't know. Is it a miracle? Could God just like magically give them the power to speak? Yes. But is that really the point that we're supposed to get here? Or are we supposed to read this and go, man, heaven is a lot more physical than I thought it was. There is a, a realness to it, uh, a, an actual like sense that it's tangible. 
in some way, okay? So the current heaven and the current hell are far more physical than, than spiritual. Now, I know some of you guys are like, well, if my body is in the ground and we haven't had the resurrection yet, how can it be physical? We're going to answer that question in a moment. All right, let's keep moving because I don't want to run out of time tonight. Um, let's get into these burning, burning questions. Some of these are questions that you, oh, let me, I'm sorry, I should just um, point out a couple more quick things in relation to this idea that the afterlife is a lot more physical than we give it credit for. Here are a couple more uh, ideas, okay? Um, if you pay attention to the afterlife, uh, I'm sorry, if you pay attention to the stories of the afterlife, the passages that detail the afterlife, you will find again and again language that describes the four dimensions that we live in, space and time. Okay, you will find send Lazarus over here to me. He is over there at that coordinate and he needs to come over here to this coordinate. That's the three dimensions that we know of. Then there's time. How long, oh Lord? So there is a physicality to heaven when we think about the dimensions that exist in eternity. Then we look at Jesus. The scripture tells us that when Jesus resurrected from the dead, that he had a body, a physical body, right? In Luke 24, 43, we're told that he ate a piece of fish. He ate a physical piece of fish in a glorified body. In John 20, uh, uh, Thomas touched him and saw that he was solid, physical, right? He breathed on the disciples in John 20. And then in Acts chapter number one, verse nine, Jesus ascends to heaven in a cloud. These angels show up and they're like, hey, dum-dums, why are you sitting here staring at your savior? Go up into heaven. Don't you know that he is going to return in the same way you just saw him leave? Physically, bodily, you saw him go into heaven and he's coming back again. So Jesus, who had a physically glorified body, currently exists, lives. He is in the afterlife. So at least one person is there who is physical and has a body. And if Jesus does, and we see this other evidence uh, locked away in these different passages, hidden away for us to discover, then I don't think it's unreasonable to think that heaven is much more physical than we think. And there are a few others, but we're running short on time. So I'll leave that for another day. Okay. Burning questions. I know burning question. We're talking about heaven and hell, Dan, and you want to say burning questions. That's a bad joke, bro. I know. I know. It's my sense of humor. Okay. Um, some of these are questions that you sent. Some of these are probably questions I think you might have. So let's see if we can answer some of them for you, okay? Where is heaven and hell? If it's a physical place, then it's got to exist somewhere, right? So where is it? Could we locate it? Now, this is one of those things that the Bible never tells us. God never gives us any indication whatsoever about where heaven or hell is. In classic conception, heaven is out there in the stars somewhere. And hell is like down at the center of the earth with the molten lava and all that, right? Guess what? That's not from the Bible. That's from Dante's Inferno, okay? And Dante's Paradise. That comes more from him than it does from the scripture. And as we'll see over the next two weeks, when we talk about the reality and nature of hell, we're going to see that most of the things we think are true about hell don't come from the Bible. They don't come from Jesus. They come from this poet who wrote in the Middle Ages. And so um, we've got a lot of unlearning to do. I don't know where heaven is. I don't know where hell is. I don't know if it's accessible to us. Is it in our universe or is it in some other universe altogether? Is it another dimension? Is it the upside down? I, I don't know, man. I can't say. But what I can say is there is this physicality to it that leads me to believe that wherever it is, people exist in some form within it, all right? Um, it's unlikely that we would ever be able to locate heaven. Uh, now, this, I think, probably is spiritual, although it could be, a, or a symbolic thing, although it could be very, very hyper-literal. I don't know. At the end of Genesis chapter number three, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And the scripture says that God places an angel with a flaming sword. It's like the only time a flaming sword is ever mentioned in the Bible. I want to know more about it but we're not given any information. God places an angel with a flaming sword so that nobody will ever enter the garden again. Now, this could be totally symbolic. That's kind of what I think it is. It's like, we're never going to be able to recover what we lost 
until Jesus returns and makes it all right. I think that's what it means, but I don't know, dude, maybe actually Garden of Eden is somewhere and we've just never discovered it. Who knows? Okay. I don't know where heaven is. I don't know where hell is, but it exists somewhere. I can at least take that by faith because Jesus seems to speak of it as actually existing somewhere. Okay. All right. Next question. This is the one I posed a moment ago. How can people have a physical form in the intermediate state if the resurrection hasn't happened yet? So we're talking about people who are in the current hell and heaven, the temporary one, okay? And the physical resurrection has not yet taken place. So how can we say that they have a physical body when they haven't been reunited with their physical body? What's going on here, all right? Now, this is another one of the areas in which God does not give us very much information. We don't have any evidence of significance to go on, but we can make some inferences. We can make some educated guesses. And probably the first thing we need to know or, or make mention of is that the body, whatever body we possess in the intermediate state, the current heaven or the current hell, that is not the same body that we have here on earth. Because if it was, then the physical resurrection that is discussed in Revelation 20 makes no sense. I already have the body. So it's not the same body. I will get that body back glorified, recreated anew without sin at some date in Revelation 20. So I don't think it's the same one, okay? Probably the best guess we can make is that God fashions some kind of temporary body, some sort of form, physical form, that is connected to and continuous with the identity that we carried here on earth for our sojourn in the current heaven and the current hell, okay? We don't want to guess too much about this because, like, the Bible just doesn't say. And I can give you ideas and theories and spout off my personal opinion on it, but who cares what I think, okay? But let me point to you, let me point you to one passage of scripture. Um, this is 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And if we read here in verses 1 through 10, this entire section is all about death, our bodies, what it's like in heaven. Look at what Paul says. He says here, starting in verse number one, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, earthly tent. So thankfully he clarifies. He says that is when we die and we leave this earthly body. So Paul is comparing our earthly body with a tent, okay? A temporary shelter, so to speak. We know that when this earthly tent is uh, taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven. So we're going from a tent to a house. Come on, somebody. All right. And it, it, that house is an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. There you go. We're not going to be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan inside, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not yet at home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing, faith and not by sight. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We must all stand before the bema seat of Christ. That's what this passage says. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Okay, so Paul says, when you die, you shed the tent, but you gain the house. You have a body in the afterlife. I don't know exactly how it works, but that's the promise. And all the evidence that we have in these passages points to that very fact. Okay, cool. I'm excited about that. I hope my new body has a six pack. We'll see. All right, here we go. Spicy question time. What about purgatory, Dan? I've heard about purgatory. I used to go to a church that taught there was purgatory. So how does that fit in to this little chart and timeline that you've put together? Okay, let's talk about this. So Catholics believe that when you die, you go to an intermediate state before the intermediate state, okay? You go to a temporary place before the temporary place 
before you go to the final eternity. This place is called Purgatory. And it's called purgatory because they believe that in this temporary waiting room, so to speak, you are purged, purgatory, purged of your outstanding sins, right? According to Catholic teaching, um, everybody who goes to purgatory will eventually go to heaven. It just takes time, okay? We, we have to pay for whatever sins we have that we have not done penance for or ask forgiveness for. So you'll see here on this chart, it's slightly different here. You die, you go through the particular judgment, and then you'll see before you go to the temporary heaven, you go to this place called purgatory. All right. Now, Catholic doctrine teaches that we can help people out of purgatory by praying for them, by doing good deeds in their name. You know, it's almost like they get the credit for the good stuff that we do in their name. And it kind of speeds up the process of paying off their outstanding sin debt so that they can move from uh, purgatory and into heaven. All right. Well, let me share with you some problems I have with this particular idea of purgatory. Number one, Purgatory is never once ever, period, mentioned in the 66 books of the Bible, okay? 66 books of the Bible here, and never once does the word purgatory exist, does some version of purgatory exist. There is absolutely nothing in this book that hints at or teaches that there is an intermediate state between the intermediate state and here. Okay, it doesn't exist. Now, what you may know or you might not know is that my Bible and probably the Bible that most of you have has 66 books in it. A Catholic Bible has an extra 14 books, and it's called the Apocrypha. And it's a collection of writings that detail events that supposedly happened between the time that the book of Malachi was written, which is the last book of the Old Testament and the time that the book of Matthew was written. There's a several hundred year gap in between Malachi and Matthew and or the events described in Matthew. It wasn't the earliest book written, but the events described the birth of Jesus. And during this several hundred year gap, God was still at work. There were still miracles. There were still things happen. And the apocryphal books claim to detail them. And they may be true. They may even be historical, but we don't believe that they are inspired in the same way that these 66 books are. What does this have to do with purgatory? Well, the entire idea for purgatory in the Catholic school of thought is based on one verse from one book in the Apocrypha. I'm going to put it here on the screen. Some of you guys have never, ever seen the Apocrypha before. So here you go. Okay. In 2 Maccabees, okay, that's the book name, 2 Maccabees, chapter number 12. If we scroll all the way down to the very last sentence of this chapter, um, there's a guy named Judas Maccabeus, and he is leading a revolt against some Roman rulers. Okay. He's leading a revolt against an occupying government. And he ends up winning this war, this insurrection. And in fact, Hanukkah, the celebration, the festival of lights, is a celebration of a miracle that God did during the Maccabean revolt. Do I believe that God did a miracle? Yes, 100% I believe that. Do I believe the telling of that miracle or the telling of the Maccabean revolt is inspired in the same way that 2 Kings, for instance, or 2 Corinthians is inspired? No. And there are a bunch of different reasons why it doesn't really matter. What I want you to focus on here is our Catholic brothers and sisters at one time read this thing in which Judas uh, he made an offering on behalf of some people who died in battle. Basically, the belief was they died in battle because they were sinful and God didn't protect them. And so we read here, the final verse says, thus he made an offering of reconciliation so that the dead would be forgiven of their sin. Okay, please, please, please make sure you stick with me here. This is not in the Bible. This is in extra biblical historical books. Now, Catholics saw that and they said, hmm, okay, he made an offering of reconciliation so that the dead would be forgiven of their sins. So if we were to do something on behalf of the dead, then they could be forgiven of their sins, right? 
But we read in Luke chapter number 16, remember when Lazarus, or I'm sorry, the rich man says, hey, Abraham, will you send Lazarus over here to, you know, dip his finger in water and help relieve my anguish? He's told, no, there is a great gulf fixed between us, and nobody can pass from hell into heaven, or even vice versa. So we know that people can't go to hell and then move into heaven. But we also know that sin can't go into heaven. So what does that mean? Well, I guess it means there must be a middle place. And in that middle place, people who are believers but haven't quite been forgiven of all of their sins go and they hang out until all of their sin is purged and they are granted entrance into heaven, okay? That is literally the line of thought that gave birth to the entire doctrine of purgatory. And it is literally based on this one tiny verse that actually had nothing to do with like making an offering so that the dead could move on to the next stage in the afterlife. All right. There nothing. Okay. So let me point out some reasons why, um, besides the fact that this simply doesn't exist in the Bible, let me point out some, some reasons why I don't think that this is a biblical doctrine as well. Okay. Number one, it is contrary to everything that we read in the gospels. Okay. So everything we read in the gospels is that Jesus died and he paid for our sins. I don't have to pay for my sins. There is no condemnation, therefore, for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't have to pay any of my sins because Christ paid for every single one of them. He died for all of my sins, past, present, and future, okay? If that's true, then what sins do I have left to pay off, right? It insinuates that Jesus paid for some of my sins, but not all of them or that Jesus made it possible for me to pay for my sins. And that is not the gospel. The gospel is that God loves you so much that Jesus paid the price that you could not pay so that you could get the reward that you did not deserve, eternal life, okay? So this whole idea of purgatory, it undercuts the gospel. It makes a mockery of the death of Christ saying it wasn't sufficient for us and that we somehow need to make up the difference. Jesus paid most of my debt. I need to take care of the last little bit. That's not it. That creates a works-based salvation. That says, essentially, you need to earn your spot in heaven by paying for your sins, okay? And then also, the idea that you go to this temporary space, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then eventually the jailer comes and opens the door, and he's like, all right, you've done your sentence. Time to go to heaven, okay? Uh, that is so the opposite of what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Go ahead, unmute. Somebody tell the group. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today, today. So either this guy had very little sin, which is weird because he's a thief. He's being put to death for his crimes. Either this guy had so little sin that he's going to get to purgatory and they're going to be like, dude, 10 minutes, you're ready to go. Or there is no purgatory. Jesus said today, you'll be with me in paradise. That's the promise he gave to the thief. And because there's nothing else in the Bible that indicates that there is a place you need to go to be purged from your sin, because everything we read in the scripture says that Jesus has died to pay for all of my stupid mistakes so that I can be forgiven and freed from the weight of all of my screw ups and sins. Purgatory, my friends, is an unbiblical doctrine. Nobody's there because it doesn't exist. And you can't do anything to help people get to another level in the afterlife. You will not find anything in here, right? There's not, the rich man doesn't say, hey, can you tell Lazarus to pray for me so that one day my sins might be forgiven and I could join you guys over there? He never says that. There is literally nothing that can change once we pass through that particular judgment. Death, as we said last week, is a one-way door. It only goes in one direction. And once you pass through it, there is no changing rooms, so to speak. All right, I'm sorry to get worked up here, but I'm afraid that too many people have a misunderstanding about what's going to happen to them and their loved ones when they die, when God has given us clarity. All right, a couple of quick questions here. Uh, nope, we just did that one. How about this one? Should we pray to the saints in the current heaven? 
right? There are some, you know, religious schools of thought, so to speak, practice that would say, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death, right? There are, you know, I'm going to pray to the saint of um, electrical workers or miners or whatever. I'm going to pray to them. And, and I want to be really clear here. Okay, sometimes us Protestants misunderstand what our Catholics or, or Orthodox brothers and sisters are doing. Okay, they're not praying to the saints as if the saints can answer their questions or answer their prayers. That's not it. The idea is because saints are in heaven and they're closer to God and they don't need sleep because they're in heaven, they could just pray 24 seven. That's all they do, right? They just pray for us. And so I could pray for 10 minutes or I could pray for 10 minutes to a saint who will then turn around and pray 24 seven for me. That sounds like a better return on my investment, except there's nothing in the Bible, nothing in the Bible that says that we should ask saints to pray for us. It literally doesn't exist. There is not, I, I challenge you, find it, search it, send it to me. You won't, it's not there, okay? So this is a, a teaching that has been built up on tradition and in the same way that we saw this one verse and it's like, well, if that's true, then what about this and then that and that and maybe that and that. And suddenly you have this whole theology that's built up and it's just like based on this one tiny little narrow reading of something, it's not there. So look, if you're gonna pray, don't pray to a saint, pray to Jesus. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Pray straight to him. That's one of the beauties of being a Christian, the priesthood of all believers. I don't have to have an intermediary. I don't have to confess my sins to a father. I confess my sins to the father. Hello. I don't have to, you know, go through somebody else in order to have a relationship with God. Jesus is the one who enabled me to have a relationship with God. I'm preaching tonight. I'm getting worked up. So don't pray to dead saints. Don't offload your prayer life. Pray directly to God, he'll answer it for you. Now, a related question and an interesting one is, do the saints in heaven pray uh, for or on behalf of those on earth? Do they pray for us? Now, that's a different question. I'm not saying whether we should ask them to pray for us, but do they pray for us? And I think if we've already established that they have some awareness of what is going on here on earth, then it makes sense that they pray in some way. Think about those martyrs around the throne. And they're saying, how long, O oh Lord, will you wait before you execute justice on those who, who took our lives? That is essentially a prayer, isn't it? Now, it's not the prayer that we normally think of in which grandma's up there and she's like, God, please bless my grandson. He's such a knucklehead. He needs you. Take care of him. Protect him. Like, this is a much, like, deeper, heavier, like, real prayer, okay? These martyrs praying for justice. But they seem to be offering prayers on behalf of what is happening here on earth. So I would say tentatively, yes, people, saints in heaven, pray for even things that are happening on earth. But that doesn't mean we have guardian angels, guardian saints, you know? I mean, like, look, God loves you. God is looking out for you. You don't need St. Agnes looking out for you when you've got the Holy Spirit with you every single day. Okay, so the big question you guys all wanna know, what will we do all day in heaven and hell? What is it actually going to be like? And that's what we're gonna answer starting next week. We're going to spend two weeks on the existence and the nature of hell. It's a real thing, according to Jesus, anyway. But most of what you think about hell is not biblical. Hell is just as bad as you thought, but for totally different reasons. And these different reasons actually teach us more about God and his nature and us and our nature than the traditional conceptions of hell. I, I can't wait. You guys are going to love it. Okay. Um, then we're going to spend three weeks talking about heaven. What do we do in heaven, both in the current heaven and what will we do for all of eternity? And I promise you it's better than anything you've ever been told. It's so, so good. All right. So we're going to leave off there. We've got about five minutes left tonight before we sign off. So I want to open the floor. What questions do you have? Burning questions that I didn't answer. More clarification you might want. Uh, here's your chance. Let's talk a little bit about some of this stuff. Uh, Dan, I have a question. Please. Francis, uh, Dan, a lot of religions 
you know, when I did uh, research, it did speak about reincarnation. Mm. Say that uh, some people, uh, especially who have uh, something, uh, any ties back on earth, they get reincarnated and they come back on earth. And some of it, they say, uh, if you've done something bad, then you get reincarnated into something which is not that great, which you wouldn't want. So what are your views and thoughts about reincarnation after that? Yeah. So um, I would point back to Hebrews 9.27, which we read kind of at the top of our discussion tonight, that it's appointed to man once to die. Okay. And after that, to face judgment. There's nothing that indicates a death and rebirth cycle here. Okay. When we talk about resurrection, that's different than reincarnation. It is a one-time thing that happens and it will exist for all of eternity. Now, frankly, Oh, man, I don't know how deep I want to get into this. Okay, I think people do not consider the implications of a belief in reincarnation, okay? If you, if karma determines what level of reincarnation you come back at, we can be kind of silly here and like, okay, you can be reincarnated as a snail or something like that, you know, and you got to work your way up to a human. Okay, listen now, and... and, and I'm just giving you facts here. I'm not disparaging, but I want you to think about the implications of believing in reincarnation. According to Hindu doctrine in particular, there, is, there are steps of reincarnation, and there are some humans that are lower than other humans when it comes to reincarnation. That's why we have untouchables. That's why we have the caste system because they're bad they've been bad in their past lives and they're getting justice and they're paying for their sins and one day they can be like us it's racist just straight up i'm sorry i i, I don't mean to be rude i don't but that is straight up it's racism that this class of people is being punished or deserves their lower state in life and maybe one day they can be like us it just gets under my skin and so like there is this part of reincarnation that appeals to our sense of justice and fairness in which we're like yeah if you do bad in this life and you're given another chance then maybe you should have to make up for the things that you did wrong i get it that seems equitable but when you walk out the implications of what that means for people, disabled people are being punished. My God doesn't punish people by making them disabled. My God doesn't punish people by making them black. My God doesn't punish people by making them female. Okay. But that is what a reincarnation theology would teach. And I'm so uncomfortable with the implications of it that regardless of the fact that it does not exist, it's not taught anywhere here in the Christian Bible, I would just flat reject it outright. Thanks, Dan. That was a fair answer. What other questions do you guys have? Yeah, Pastor Dan, I'm mm -hmm. just thinking that uh, for those whose uh, names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, uh, there's a second judgment, and there will be rewards. But for those who are thrown in the, well, uh, in, in hell, temporary hell, I'm sure, I mean, like the bad people there do not have the same degrees of like badness or meanness. Wouldn't that count? I mean, you know, some people could be, uh, probably they just didn't hear the gospel, well, or, or they were not saved or, or just rejected it. But others could be like, persecuting Christians or believers, yeah, uh, wouldn't that be considered? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so the short answer is yes. And we are going to address this in depth over the next two weeks. But here's the deal. If we've already established, and we will establish even further, that not everyone experiences the same heaven. There are differing levels of reward. There, are, You're going to find out that 
heaven is going to be very different, but still wonderful and fulfilling and satisfying and perfect, if we can use that word for everyone, but it's going to be very different. If that's true in heaven, then we might also expect it to be true of hell. And if we think, all right, maybe it's also true of hell, I wonder if there is any evidence in the Bible that people might experience differing degrees of judgment in the afterlife. I don't want to spoil too much, but one time Jesus said, it's going to be more tolerable for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah than for you Pharisees on Judgment Day. More tolerable on Judgment Day. That means for some people like these Pharisees, like this town that rejected Christ, it is much less tolerable, much worse. So I'm going to show you that there are differing degrees of judgment that uh, people who simply rejected Christ will not experience the same level of judgment as Nazis or serial killers or anything like that, okay? But again, it goes even further beyond that because what we're going to discover is hell is not a place in which God tortures people. Hell is not a place in which God tortures people. Hell is a place where people exist in the full torment and anguish of their own decisions. That's what hell is going to be. Not torture, torment. Not God-imposed, self-imposed. We're going to see that the door to hell is locked, but it's locked from the inside that people spend an eternity separated from God because they don't want God any more in the afterlife than they did in the present life. Oh my God, I'm telling you guys, next week is gonna be so good. I'm really hyped about it. Okay, we don't have much time left, so we're gonna go ahead and pray. Um, please make plans to tune in next week. I, I really believe this has the power to completely reshape what you believe about hell. You may just walk away saying, okay, hell hurts me, but apparently hell hurts God too. And hell is a monument to man's freedom and God's justice. And it's a necessary thing. If there's going to be a heaven, then there also needs to be this place called hell. We'll talk about that next week. I'm going to pray for you guys now. If you have questions, if you guys need me to pray for you about something, if you need to talk about something that's going on in your life, please send me an email, dan at connectcalgary.ca. You're not bothering me. This is my job. I'm your pastor here to help you guys. Okay, let's pray. God, I love you, and I thank you so much for your word, which is so rich. God, like it is alive and active, and we are never going to be able to fully plumb the depths of it. So thank you for showing us that tonight, for revealing new tidbits and tantalizing clues about just how good heaven is going to be for those of us who have accepted Christ and new life through him. I pray for each person who's a part of the group that your Holy Spirit would speak to them and that God, if they have never made that decision to place their faith and trust in you, to ask for forgiveness of their sins and to be adopted into your family, that they would choose to do it even tonight. And God, we thank you for the promise that you will receive them and grant them eternal life because of their faith. So God, make this happen uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit and continue to bless our study in your word. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you guys. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week.